I guess the bell rang already. I didn't hear it. Welcome to everybody this morning. Welcome to everybody on uh, live feed. Uh, Pastor wanted me to announce there will be fly in Junior Lutherans tonight. I uh, want to make a correction in the bulletin. Uh, the bulletin says that there will be service next week with communion. There will not be service. This was our vacation Sunday, and hopefully it will be a visitation Sunday for all of you. Uh, with that in mind, uh, communion, the communion will be postponed then until the next, the following Sunday, so there will be service and with communion on the 8th when we come back. Uh, I think that's really all the announcements that I know of. Yes? Yeah, if you notice, Diane put a list of uh, when all the different church services are from around here. She said she f forgot to put faith in. It's at 9 o'clock. So kind of keeping that. I would definitely encourage you people to go visit all your other local congregations. There's plenty around. Just go visit them. Okay. Uh, a kindergarten teacher was telling her students about different kinds of animals. Whales are the largest, she said, but they cannot swallow people because they're Throats are too small. But in the Bible, it says that Jonah was swallowed by a whale, said a little girl. You can't always believe what you read, the teacher replied. Well, when I go to heaven, said the little girl, I'll ask Jonah. And what if Jonah didn't go to heaven? Well, then you can ask her. <laughs> this morning we have a birthday. Where is Isaiah? Birthday to Isaiah. Happy birthday. So let's sing to Isaiah. Good morning. Thank you for being here to worship together today. I'm excited to be here with you and to worship our Lord and Savior. We begin our service this morning in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And our call to worship comes from Psalm 136, it's verses 1 through 9. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to to the God of gods, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who alone does great wonders, for his lo loving kindness is everlasting. To him who made the heavens with skill, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who spread out the earth above the waters, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who made the great lights, for his loving kindness is everlasting. The sun to rule by day, for his loving kindness is everlasting. The moon and stars rule by night, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Would you please rise together as we open in prayer and then we sing our opening song? Lord Jesus, we are thankful that you are everlasting. That you begin and you are the end. Lord Jesus, that we turn to you for all blessing, for all need, knowing that you are everlasting. Lord Jesus, may it be that you are glorified by this service, that you are in the service, that you lift up and establish your believers, Lord God, today. We pray that you would hear our praise and worship to you. In your holy and precious name, amen.
these these hymns were picked before the uh, sermon completely came about. And so remember the second line of the first verse where it says, Early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. Let us continue worshiping as we come before our Lord and Savior this morning and confess our sins. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and ask you for Christ's sake, Grant us forgiveness of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's because of promises like this in the word of God, from the mouth of God himself, and because of the completed work of Christ on the cross in your place, I can declare to you that your sins have been forgiven. Amen. Please be seated. We'll call on the scripture reader at this time. The Old Testament lesson this morning comes from Genesis chapter 9, beginning with verse 8. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. It is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. And never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and everything, every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow, my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it. And remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Epistle lesson this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 3 beginning with verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, 
To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Here end the lessons. How many of you love science? Anybody here love science? What is it uh, that uh, causes the rainbow to, to come? What is it? Brecken. Yeah, and the water, and the water does what to it? It bends the light, right? It bends the light. And then therefore we can see the rainbow. Isn't it interesting then to know that God made the promise on the bow, but that bow was created before rain ever fell, was established in the water that the entire earth was created from. Interesting. Please rise for the reading of the gospel text. Mark chapter 6, verse 45 through 56. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he would dismiss the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land, and he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And at about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost, and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But he immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astonished, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they came to the land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring sick people on their beds to wherever they, wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came, in the villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that he might touch even the fringes of his garment, and as many as touched it were made well. Here ends the reading of God's word. Now let us confess our holy faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. be seated. We'll call on the children at this time for the children's message. Lana, I love your dress. This beautiful yellow. Well, it's two things. 
Oh, they go together. What are they? Walkie talkies. Walkie talkies. Oh, you did so we could use them right now? Should we use that as should we use that as the lesson when they get too close to God then you beep? No. So they're used to communicate each other from from further distances, right? And I think these ones can can be up to at least two miles. I think when we bought them, we were thinking that maybe you guys would use them when we were traveling if we had two different vehicles and then you could talk to each other maybe. So, I mean, this is a pretty easy one, isn't it? No. Well. If, if you were to go in the other room over there where I couldn't see you, I'd be able to communicate with you, right? Yeah. yeah. So, and, and we can't, sometimes we see Jesus, right? But we communicate with him, don't we? Now, how does that happen? So let's do this. Isaiah, it's your birthday. Yeah. Go stand on the other side of those doors over there. All right. Can we talk to Isaiah? No. no. Listen, listen. Listen to the way I say this. Is there a way for us to talk to Isaiah? Yes. How is that way? Because well, we because we have the walkie-talkies, that's the way. But like if I if we go right now, is there a way? No. No, there's no way. Like I'm talking to him right now and he doesn't even know. Isaiah, did you know that you are beautiful? He, he has no idea what I'm saying. I could say all kinds of stuff, and he doesn't know. So there's a way that we can talk with God. What is that way? Yes. Prayer is how. What is the way? Think, think broader. Yes. What? Communicate? Yeah, that, that's true. We need to communicate. There is only one mediator between God and man. The man, Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Right? How is it that we can pray and that God hears us? Because Christ made a way. So, come on in. Lazarus, come forth. Yeah, that's a good point. So, how does that work, Levi? Okay. When you were in your sin, what were you? Starts with a D, ends with an ed. Dead. You were dead in your trespasses. Can a dead man hear? No. No. Dead man can't hear. But when Christ calls forth into the darkness and calls the dead to life, do they hear? Absolutely. So Christ makes the way when there is no way. Do you understand? It's by the power of Christ. It's by his birth, his life, and his death, and his resurrection that we are able to live, that we are able to communicate. In fact, that we are able to do anything is because of Christ. Do you understand? All right. Do you believe that? Yes. Wow. Do you believe that? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Good job, John. I was going to give it to Alana. I was so mesmerized by her dress. Here you go. Ready? Arms out. Arms together. Lord, thank you for doing the impossible, for opening the way, for being the way, giving us the ability to come before you, giving us the ability to live, to have life and to breathe, to find forgiveness and resurrection, that we have life in your name. Thank you for being all things for us in your holy and precious name. Amen.
Hannah. All right. Are you excited? Okay, I expect a really, really good one. Two weeks, that's right. Two weeks. Okay, you guys can go be seated. Yeah, because next week there's vacation church. You'll see. Today's text comes from Mark chapter 6, verses 45 through 52. So the lesson was from 45 to 56, and I'm specifically sticking with the one incident before following the end there. Similarly, uh, in the Synoptic Gospels, you find the same event told in Matthew chapter 14, verses 24 through 33. And also in John chapter 6, verses 16 through 21. 
and I'll make reference to them as we go through here. <coughs> Would you pray with me as we begin? Jesus, all wisdom and understanding lays in you. May it be, O oh Lord Jesus, right now that your word goes forth, that you speak it mightily and that your spirit moves among it, that it applies to our life. Pray, Lord Jesus, that, that you would grant ears to hear, that you would grant understanding. For the sake of the gospel, O oh Lord, and for your glorification, may it be that we believe, that we see the truth of your mercy and your grace. O oh Lord, give us the beauty of your mercies and your gospel. From your word today, we ask these things, and in your holy and precious name, Jesus, amen. I'd like to read for you something, and it's going to seem odd, and I wasn't expecting for the sermon as I was preparing it over this um, passage of scripture, I wasn't expecting for this to come, and uh, yeah, it, it, it did. So in folk, I'm going to read this for you. In folklore, the witching hour or devil's hour is a time of night that is associated with supernatural events whereby witches, demons, and ghosts are thought to appear and be at their most powerful. The phrase witching hour began at least as early as 1775 in the poem Night, an ode, by Reverend Matthew West. Though its origins may go back further to 1535, where the Catholic Church prohibited activities during the 3 to 4 a.m. time frame due to emerging fears about witchcraft in Europe. In the Western Christian tradition, the hour between 3 and 4 a.m. was considered a period of peak supernatural activity. This time is also referred to as the devil's hour due to its being a mocking inversion of the time in which Jesus supposedly died, which was at 3 p.m., The witching hour may stem to a human's sleep cycle and rhythm. The body is going through REM sleep at that time, which is the deepest sleep, where the heart rate is slower, body temperature reduced, breathing pattern and blood pressure irregular. Therefore, sudden awakening from the deepest sleep would cause agitation, fear, and disorientation in an individual. Also, during REM sleep, which is usually occurs within the witching hour, Unpleasant and frightful sleeping disturbances, such as parasomnias, can be experienced, which include nightmares, rapid eye movement sleep behavior disorder, night terrors, sleepwalking, homicidal, homicidal sleepwalking, and sleep paralysis. Moreover, during the night and well into the witching hour, symptoms of illness and conditions such as lung disease, uh, asthma, flu, and common colds seem to exasperate because there is less cortisol in the blood late at night and especially during sleep. As such, the immune system becomes very active and the white blood cells fight infection in the body during sleep and this would thereby worsen the symptoms of fever, nausea, congestion, coughing, chills, and sweats. <laughs> Maybe you're wondering why I talk of such a time not too long ago, <clears throat> Levi came into our room, scared, very scared, told us there was somebody parked outside with their lights on. So we got up and we went outside, and I'm not sure why Levi was up at that time, thankfully he was. We went out to the, to the living room or to the kitchen, and we could see out our door that somebody parked next to Kaya's car in the parking places where we park our vehicles. Their lights were on, shining into the uh, yard. And sometimes at night, our dogs bark constantly. 
nonstop at coyotes and rabbits or whatever else is humping around. And so many times we put them in the garage overnight so that we can actually sleep. And so the dogs had been in the garage and so we couldn't hear them barking. And I went to look and sure enough, there was somebody there and they had their dome light on in their car. I don't know why they were there. And then they continued to do, I don't know, what looked like smoking crack or something. They must have seen us watching them from the window. And then they pulled out very slowly and drove away very slowly. It's quite terrifying, really. Guess what time it was when that happened? Between three and four. As we start here, it says that Jesus immediately made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he himself sending the crowd away. That crowd that he was sending away was that from the feeding of the 5,000. We also note and see later in the text that they did not receive what they should have received from the feeding of the 5,000 in verse 52, for they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. So here the disciples, in connection with what we remember from last week, they have done this ministry, they've gone out two by two, they've been in the middle of Christ's ministry to the people. They've seen many things. When they come back at this time, one of the things that they see and that they have happen is that they are supposed to go off by themselves to a secluded place so they can rest. But in, in that, the people follow them. Come on in, Levi. Come sit down. You guys need to come sit down. Pay attention. I want you to go back. Yeah, you can wait next time. Come sit down. You're a big boy. So, as they are coming together, they long to spend time with Jesus and they long to be refreshed and rejuvenated, but that doesn't happen. And as I supposed last week of how frustrating that might have been for them, you recognize then from today in verse 52 that their heart was hardened because of what took place. As Jesus poured out compassion on the people who needed him and loved, and he loved them, the disciples were hardened. So he sends them away, and I'm not sure the purpose for that, right? We don't know that. It doesn't tell us in the text. Was Jesus frustrated with their behavior and the lack of the fact that they got what was happening, that their heart was not in line with his heart, that they were hardened? Was it that in his fully God and fully man place, he needed time to connect with God himself? So as he sends the crowd away, he so too sends his disciples away so that he can go up on a hill and pray. I'm not sure why, but what does happen is that he went to the mountain to pray. When it was evening, so recognize, I'm not sure at what time Jesus sent the people away. Must have been after what I would say dinner time. My wife would say supper time. I'm not sure which one's right. Probably my wife. Yep. (laughs) It was after that period of time and before evening, before it had gotten dark, he sends them away. So during that period of time, Jesus goes by himself to to the mountain to pray. Then evening comes. The boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. So it's dark, and they're out in the middle of the sea. I can't remember where I read. I don't know if it's in either of these two accounts here, but I thought I remember reading somewhere that they were two or three miles out away. So it's not like they were just right there, but they were out far away. And it's evening. If he's up on the mountain, even at best case, in the middle of the night, I don't know about you, but when it's dark outside, it would have been hard to see them. Would it not? 
I'm not sure I would have been able to see them out on the sea. He recognizes that they're out on the sea and he was alone on the land, seeing them straining at the oars. So wind had come up against them. And it says, at about the fourth watch of the night. Guess when the fourth watch of the night is? The time of the hour between three and six. There's something significant about that time. I wasn't sure that I understood that or recognized its importance until this sermon. In Hebrew, when it's referred to, it's referred to as daybreak. That period of time before when it's still dark to the period of time the sun breaks over the horizon and lightness comes. Specific events have taken place during that period of time that are important in Scripture. Jacob wrestles with God until this time. That can be found in Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 through 31. Moses parts the Red Sea, and it says as daybreak comes that the sea swallows up the Egyptians. That's in Exodus chapter 14, verses 25 and 26. Gideon defeats the Midianites in Judges chapter 7, verses 19 through 24. Some make account of Jesus' birth told by the angels was during this time though it's not quite specific enough for me to think that it might be it, but somebody did include it in that time frame. One that is far important, the women, as they prepared to come to the tomb to find Christ. During this time, they find that Jesus Christ had been risen. The idea of the watchman is found throughout Scripture, but specifically in the Old Testament. We can remember certain verses specifically from Psalms. Psalm 30, chapter, uh, verse, chapter 130, verse 6, where he says, More than the watchman for the morning, as he speaks about him waiting for the Lord... Why was it so, so important that morning come? As a watchman, what did morning mean? The night had been successful. The watch had been complete. That the enemy had not come or overcome in the middle of the night. And so it was so important for the watchman to be there, watching over the city, being prepared to call in an instant, people into action to care for and to watch over those who are of the city. And the watchman, he looked and waited for the morning. And it says in Psalm, I wait for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. Psalm 36, verse 6, I remember you on my bed. I meditate on you in the night watch. Is it significant that the time of great distress that even maybe can be seen today may not just be supernatural, but also could be science and psychological and physical, that the time that we may be in the greatest need be that very witching hour? And it was at that time that Christ himself was not found asleep, but found praying 
That it was in that very hour of need that Christ came. And he was not stopped by even the laws of physics and nature. For who among us has ever walked on water? Psalm 119, verse 147. I rise before dawn, I cry for help, I wait for your words. And we sang it even this morning, did we not? The second line of the first verse from our opening song. They were alone. They were not making headway. They were at the mercy of the sea and the wind. And Jesus came to them. How would you feel if you had been a disciple in that boat? Or how do you feel even now in your life when you feel like there's no headway to be made, that Jesus has sent you, but as you've gone, he waited on shore. And it's night. Does he see? Can he see? I can't see him. I don't know where he is. I don't know if he's up on the mountain or where he's gone. What I know is the waves are spraying me in the face, and I'm afraid I'm going to perish. This scenario is not saved for the disciples in that boat alone, but a very picture of our own life and salvation. Is it not? Who among us can save us? I know some of you are extremely strong and fit. In fact, I know one guy sitting in this room who at a very, very ripe age was just whitewater rafting. Were there times that you felt like you might have been a little bit at the mercy of the river? <laughs> just a little. Just a little. We can't save ourselves. And as Jesus comes out to them, they're frightened. They misunderstand what's happening. They think he's a ghost. I'm not sure I would have thought anything different. When was the last time you saw a Savior walking on water, right? Like, it's just not normal. But from Matthew chapter 14, verses 24 and 33, do not forget, do not forget that this is when Peter is called out onto the water. It's in this time when Jesus comes to them in their hour of great need, in their insufficiency, and as Peter says, if it's you, Lord, then you call me out on there. And he says, Peter, come. And Peter begins to walk. But the wind and waves are strong. And he sinks. What does Peter do in verse 30? Lord, save me! Jesus asks, why did you doubt? And in the witching hour, the most challenging and weakest place we can be, is it not doubt? that we fight against? And is it not doubt that Satan uses to try to separate us from God himself? Did, did he really say that? Can he really forgive sins? Can he be in two places at once? He's, he's fully, fully man. Is it not doubt that seeds us into unbelief? But as Christ saves because he came to them in their time of need, as it's in him and him alone who creates and establishes faith, 
as he works in and through us, not only to save us, but to grant life. What happens? They worship him saying, you are certainly God's son. A part of this entire story that we simply just move on past that often isn't spoken of because it comes from a shorter passage that refers to this particular event which is found in John chapter 6 verses 16 through 21. They don't even, John doesn't even tell of Peter going out onto the boat. It just says there in verse 19 and then they were rowing about three, oh it is from, from John here. They were, they were rowed out about three to four miles and they saw Jesus walking on the sea, drawing near to the boat, and they were frightened. But he says to them, it is I, do not be afraid. And do not forget to reaccount the reason and the purpose for the gospel of John is to recount those things that Jesus had did, has done that you might believe. All these other things had been added in Mark and in Matthew, but the one thing that's not added in them that is added in John by the youngest of disciples was this in verse 21. So they were willing to receive him into the boat. Well, I hope so, right? Well, he's not a ghost, and he's the Savior, and he saved us. Get in here. But this, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. Hmm. You're tired. You're weak. You're heavy laden. Come to me, for my yoke is light. Have any of you been on a lake in a rowboat when the wind comes up? I have. And I couldn't fight against it. And I was tired even though I tried. And I found myself on the opposite side of the shore that I was supposed to be on. As Jesus entered the boat, the place that they were going, immediately they found themselves at. That was not by their effort of continual rowing. They didn't have to continue rowing through the night. Jesus, in his mercy and his love, as he came to them, as he saved them, as he reassured them, as he established them, as the watchman over them, he then brings them to the place where they were going. What do they get to account for? What can they accredit of the situation to themselves? All they did was receive. Who was it? From the beginning to the very end, all things accomplished. It was Christ. I don't know when your witching hour will come. I don't know when you will be in the most need, in the most desperate of places, the most where you need reassurance than you've ever had before, where you need assurance of faith, where your faith needs to be strengthened. Maybe it's this morning. Maybe it's here. Maybe it's a year from now. Maybe it was last week and it's still carrying on into today. Remember the story, who Jesus is, the watchman, never sleeps and never slumbers. And even in the darkest of hours, we're thought that everything is stronger than I, physical and supernatural alike, it is Christ who breaks through into the morning. Let us pray. Jesus, thank you for the impossible. That being and beginning and still going 
the salvation of my soul. Continue to instill in us faith in you. Continue to have us look into the night, into the darkness, that we might see you as you intend to pass by so that we could call to you, oh Lord, let me out. Come into the boat. Be the watchman we so desperately need. Even with hardened of hearts, may your compassion and mercy fall upon us. In your holy and precious name, amen. As we come now before the altar for the daily prayers, I would ask if there are any prayers from among the congregation. I'm going to pray for visitation Sunday. You like how I changed that, Bob? Wasn't it you who said that earlier? Visitation Sunday instead of vacation Sunday? I'm going to pray that as you step out and experience God and worship Him in a, in a different congregation, that you still find His presence, His Word, and His Spirit. May it be that you're filled. And maybe even that you see that if something is done differently than here, that sometimes it's not about right or wrong, but the condition of your heart, right? What is it, God, as you step into another congregation, what is it, God, that you have that you want to speak into my life today? Would it be that you would still hear my praise and worship to you in this new congregation? So I'm praying for that for you. Are there any, any others? Yes, Kaya. When is she traveling? Over this weekend or next weekend? Like right now? Next weekend. Okay. So we've been praying for Lily Atwood and, and for her problems with her, her health, with her stomach. And she's got another round of doctor's appointments next weekend uh, at Mayo to try to figure out what's going on. So she's still struggling with those things. So we want to keep continuing to pray for her. Thank you, Kaya, for bringing that up and, and talking about that. What a great thing it is that we have the opportunity to pray for other people in our life, uh, whether it be they're Christian or not Christian, we have that opportunity to surround them and support them in prayer as we support Kaya, too, in that, right, with prayer. Beautiful thing. Troy, you got anything? Okay. All right. All right, let's go before the Lord. Remember Tim Schomburg family as well. The flowers that are on the organ are in remembrance of Tim um, as well. So that's an honor uh, to share in his life and in his memory. Dear Heavenly Lord, thank you for this altar Lord, thank you for this building. Thank you for this gathering of believers in this place, this congregation. Thank you for your calling on my life. And thank you for their calling and your calling on their life, individually and collectively. For you have asked us, Lord Jesus, to be here as believers, to bear your image in this place where we live and invest our life. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you would continue to pour out into us so that we can be with others, that we might love you and love others, Lord God, with the love that you've had. May it be that we continue to bring your mercies and that you continue to walk before us. I pray for next Sunday, Lord God, for our members and those nearby, that as our members visit and, and experience your worship in other places, Lord Jesus, that you would continue to meet them 
Guide them and love them. Open our eyes, Lord Jesus, to your love that's around us. May it be, Lord Jesus, that you fill each and every one. And pray, Lord God, for Tim and for his family as they continue to mourn. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the opportunity that we had in fellowship in life with Tim. May we continue to learn from each other, Lord Jesus. May we continue to grow as we walk side by side, working together, Lord Jesus, for your kingdom. Be with Lily and her health issues, Lord God. Give her safe travels. Lord Jesus, may she find answers. May it be your will, Lord God, that you assist her in her health problems, that she might be better. And in any case, Lord God, continue to instill in her faith and love in you. Be with Troy and his family, Lord, and for travels for them, keep them safe. Be with each family, Lord. Hold together the families of this congregation and build them up. May it be, Lord God, that you are the center of every individual, every family, and this congregation as a whole. And may it be that we are attentive to your calling, to your whispers. May it be that we see you move in our life in the big and in the small. Thank you for those who have served in our military, Lord God, served this nation that have given us the freedoms that we have, that we are able to come to services such as this. Continue to support the United States, Lord, but continue to call it to yourself. May it be that we hear your voice. May it be that your will is done as we pray that you come again. Prepare each believer for this thing, Lord, and we ask that you come quickly. Be with those who could not come today. Be with those who are shut in. Give strength to the weary, Lord. Lord, we pray these things, and we pray the way that you've taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please rise and receive the benediction. We conclude our service in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Join together now in singing our closing hymn, Victory in Jesus.